Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Simon from read.co.uk. I'm here to talk to you today about employee advocacy. Um, so why are we talking about employee advocacy today? Well, I guess the main reason is that it's a topic that comes up quite a lot with customers that we go and see. Often we get asked, who's doing this well? So uh, we thought we'd spend a bit of time researching that so we can ask that, answer that question if we get asked it. Um, today, I guess we'll be talking really about people. So advocacy isn't a a new thing, it's a phenomenon that lives within our everyday life, whether that be buying things online, visiting certain places, um, increasingly, whether it's looking at your next place of work. Advocacy is all around us, it's becoming more and more important to people to really understand what I'm getting myself into, is this the place I want to go, is this a product that I want to buy? So we're really going to be talking today about advocacy in the context of recruitment. And the way we're going to do this is by looking at some research that we conducted. So um, a couple of months ago, we uh, spoke to 2,000 workers. So these are not read.co.uk users necessarily. There's people who are employed in the market um, to talk to them about the topic of advocacy. So I guess the three strands we're going to look at today is firstly is the power of the personal, kind of looking at personal recommendations, looking at the power that they have and the impact that they can have on people around them. The second is around advocacy and action. So we'll be looking at some examples of advocacy within the workplace and some really interesting companies that are doing things differently to really disrupt the nature of talent attraction and getting people to come to their business because they trust the things that people have said rather than a faceless corporate entity telling you how great it is to work there. And then lastly, about empowering your people. So some of the ways that organisations at the moment are empowering their workforce to encourage other businesses to come and work for them. So that's what we're going through. Uh, I've got about 20 minutes, so I'll be keeping an eye out for the uh, you've gone over time message. OK, good. Right, so uh, I guess first of all, the power of the personal. So um, this is around the case, of, the case for employee advocacy. So we'll be talking about why employee advocacy is so important within the job space. So we'll start off contextualizing it within the kind of our normal everyday lives in terms of the products that we buy, but then really nailing down into the idea of what does this mean for employers and people who are specialists in talent and acquisition. So we asked our surveyees, um, are they more likely to purchase a product after a personal recommendation? Now the information that we'll come up to with now probably isn't any enormous surprise to you. So 60% of people said they would be more likely to buy a product if they received a personal recommendation. I'm sure you guys Whenever you're doing your buying, you typically look for recommendations for other people, or certainly online, as we'll talk about in a mo. Um, this is no great surprise. But people are really drawn into what people that they know and trust tell them about a certain product or service. Um, and then we talk to them about endorsements. So actually, the sorts of endorsements that they trust. 55% uh, of people said it was from someone that they know. So more than half of people said that the most important source of an endorsement is from someone that I know, someone that I trust, someone that I understand and understands me. But I guess particularly in the online space, there are other routes to market as well. So 15% said that they really trusted endorsements via advertising. Now, lots of people look at advertising, particularly product advertising, as skeptical. It is there to shift the product. But actually, people do buy into that. If it's, again, a brand that they trust, they will, they will trust the endorsement as well. Um, they also said 15% said that they trusted social influences. Now, I'll talk a little bit more in a bit about social influences and the fact that there is some scepticism about them. But people are making a living out of being social influences. So we know that people do buy into um, advocacy, not necessarily from people that they know and trust, but people that they have heard of or brands that they trust as well. So I hope you'll indulge me for a minute with a little bit of a personal anecdote. So uh, this is a, an example of advocacy. So does anyone know where this is and what this is, what this represents behind me? No? OK, so this is the Royal Albert Hall. So uh, this is specifically sing-along Christmas carols at the Royal Albert Hall. Now, um, I guess the reason this is here is this, this is an example that I thought of, or my wife told me to think of, actually, if I'm honest, um, about personal advocacy. So sing-along Christmas carols has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, it's a very big deal. I don't know whether anyone in the room has been to it. Um, no? No? OK. Well, I hadn't until a couple of years ago, because as far as I'm concerned, it would be the worst thing that I would have got involved in. I love Christmas. Our family love Christmas. My wife and I got married at Christmas. Our children love Christmas. I don't like carols. I certainly don't like the, the idea of organized singing like this. It was just left me cold. However, however, it was recommended to me by a friend of mine and was recommended to me again by another friend. So I started looking online 
um, at reviews and YouTube videos about it. And actually, through the power of someone saying to me, this is amazing, we take our family there every year, we've got multiple generations doing this, I actually bought into the concept of doing something which, if I'm honest, would have been the last thing that I wanted to do. I did say to my, to my wife, you go on your own and tell me about it afterwards. But actually, the power of someone I trust telling me that this was an amazing experience and then looking online to try and find more information about it and watching videos and, what, and looking at reviews really made me buy into the concept. And several years later, it's now become a, a family tradition. So last year, this is my family in the box. You can't see there's tinsel and Christmas lights all around us here as well. The guy on the left may look like him. That's not Father Christmas. That's my dad. But this is my family. So it's now become a tradition that we go there every year. So something that I would never have dreamed of doing, um, I went to and really enjoyed purely because I trusted the person that told me that it would be good. And then I trusted people I didn't know who really further reinforced that online. So that's advocacy and action in the Wingate household. But advocacy is nothing new, as I said. So whether it be looking at a new film or a TV program you're going to watch on Netflix, we look at, or IMDB, we look at the reviews you've had before. If it's Amazon, you look at the stars and the comments that people have created. Um, even Uber, Uber is, is two-way. So we can rate a driver, but drivers can rate us as passengers so that they know if the next driver wants to take that fare or not. But actually, the power of giving feedback and that being public is all around us all of the time. And certainly in a recruitment space, LinkedIn, and Glassdoor a part of, obviously, a lot of people's proposition here. Glassdoor are here presenting, um, exhibiting today. But it's all around us. And actually, particularly online, whether you're going on, going on holiday with TripAdvisor or you're buying something, as I've said, with Amazon, it's become sort of subliminal, actually. It becomes part of our everyday buying patterns, what we're doing in terms of this kind of idea of referrals. So I guess that's in the product space, but what about work? So... We asked our surveyees again about what the biggest influence on kind of helping them decide whether to apply for a job or not was. And actually, overridingly, so almost 40%, so the single biggest thing that would influence whether they apply for a job or not was a personal referral. So someone that they know giving them a positive review or indication that that employer is worth working for. So really important. It starts talking about the power of the individuals within your organization. It was followed by direct contact. So if you get direct contact by the end employer, um, they would buy into that because the employer has an opportunity to tell a story, to tell you what it's like working there, to really engage you in their employer brand. Um, next is seeing a job ad. So hopefully these people have been to read.co.uk and look for a job. But actually, that comes third after the idea that someone you know is saying, that, you know, place X is an amazing place to work. Go and work there or you get a phone call from an employer who says, we've got an amazing brand, we've got great benefits, come and work for us. Seeing a job ad was third. And then fourth on the list is agency contact. So getting a call from a recruitment agent is very powerful, but kind of it came fourth place after these other three. So I guess, you know, this is important for a number of reasons. You know, we have to try and work hard as, you know, I say you as in-house recruiters, and certainly us as a brand who represents many, in-house recruiters and millions of, uh, of job seekers every month to try and make sure that we have opportunities to put a direct employer and a job seeker together in this way. So I guess why personal, preferral, personal referrals? Why did our job seekers say personal referrals were so important? Well, the first is no great surprise. It's because they like the idea of getting a kind of a first-hand, unbiased opinion from an individual. The second is that they believe that the role would be better suited for them if someone can, if they can ask questions and someone can tell them a story. They believe that they will fit in better and they will be more successful in their job. Um, and third, they like the idea of getting recommendations from like-minded people or people that I know. These aren't people that, that, that are 10 degrees separated. These are people that they can ask honest questions of. They can ask for an in-depth personal view of this. But I guess these three things were fundamentally the reasons why people said, I like the idea of a personal referral rather than, as I said, seeing a job ad or getting a call from a recruitment agency. So there's something inherently personal about this journey that people are going on. So a little bit of a wrap up for this particular section. So we as consumers and job seekers do trust first-hand accounts. We do trust them more if we know the source personally, whether that be a holiday I'm going on or whether to go and do some organized singing Christmas carols or not. Um, and finally, we do respond to like-minded individuals. So we're a little more likely to trust people that we have that kind of personal connection with, a level of synergy in terms of their life and their experience. 
So I guess moving on from that, kind of looking at some more examples of advocacy in action. So in this section, we'll talk about kind of examples of why, I guess, social media and social, certainly social recruiting are becoming such a powerful way of uh, promoting your employer brand. I'll start off with a consumer example. Does anyone know what this music video is? Okay, so my children have informed me that this is uh, Despacito, which Justin Bieber features on. As a man approaching his 40s, this isn't my genre, uh, but my kids told me that, that I should know this because uh, I'm not in my 70s or 80s. But anyway, the reason this is up here is that this was the most shared piece of social media media last year, 22 million shares on Facebook. So it's an example of a music video which is shared 22 million times, which I'm sure has done Justin Bieber and other people that are involved in this pretty well. Okay, so social media is a thing which obviously is all around us, which people are constantly sharing information on, whether it be music videos or others. But, you know, why talk about this? Well, 85% of people who are employed are on Facebook. So 85% of people who are employed are on Facebook. If you look at other media, Twitter, 63%, 58% on LinkedIn, 57% on Instagram, and 47% on Snapchat. So the working population are on social media. Um, we would like to hope they're doing it out of core working hours, but let's be honest, we know they sit at their desks and do it, right? But this is why it is so important, because these are ways and means of people engaging on a constant basis with what's going on around them. And I think a really interesting statistic, is this is from some LinkedIn research, that on average, employees have networks which are 10 times bigger in aggregate than a kind of corporate profiles. Okay, so this now starts talking about why it's important to get people who are working within your organizations engaged in social media, engaged in your brand, and engaged in advocating your business. Um, so corporate brands and corporate pages on Facebook and LinkedIn are great, but actually the power sits with the individual. Actually, if you look at people's posting behavior, so over half of people are posting content generally. So this is not work content at this point. This is just content. So... More than half of the people that we asked around um, looking at Facebook are posting daily or weekly. Um, you know, for almost 40% on Twitter, less on Instagram, and less on LinkedIn. But what we know is that these trends are only going to grow, particularly stuff like Instagram. Instagram is going to continue to become a much bigger medium for people to engage with uh, a network around them. Um, when you then look at what happens in within terms of a, a work context, it becomes really interesting. So the question is, have you ever shared work-related content? So... 44% of people said they've done it on Facebook, 22 on Twitter, 23% on Instagram, and 22% on LinkedIn. Now, I was a little surprised Instagram was actually indexing higher than LinkedIn and Twitter. So again, it, turned, it starts talking about the power of that particular growing media. And actually, if you look at the demographics of that, it's 89% of under 35 said that they had shared work-related content on social media. So an older, genera older age group, less, less prevalent in terms of their posting, a younger generation are doing it all the time. Okay, so depending on the demographic of your age, of the, of the work, workforce that you have, the types of roles you have, it's really important to understand the nature of the people that are working for your businesses and to, I guess, get them to do their best at promoting your brand. Um, we then asked them about your organization's content. So this is specifically thinking about something which is posted via a corporate feed or a corporate account. So people said that, you know, 25% had posted within the last week, 19% in the last two weeks, and 42% had said that they'd never posted or never shared, sorry, uh, anything that their organization had posted. But that changes completely when you look at their sharing activity of stuff that their colleagues have done. So if you look at their colleagues, so we said 25% had posted something or shared something from their corporate profile in the last week. It jumps up to 33% when you're looking at their colleagues. And actually, everything else kind of follows suit. So the power, again, is in the networks that they have. It's not necessarily in the power of the brand itself. So it's really important to start thinking about that. How can we use kind of people within our organization to start promoting us as a place to work. And actually, again, so employee shares have double the click-through rates. So not only are they posting more or sharing more of their employees' comments, they're more likely to be, have a successful outcome on the back of it as well. So the click-through rates are double of a corporate page. So this starts talking about the fact that the power is absolutely in the hands of people who are working within your organization. Um, 
an employee-generated content, again, from, a, from an organization called MSL. Employee-generated genera content is shared 25 times, sorry, 24 times, sorry, more frequently than corporate posts. So not only does it get a better click-through rate, it just generally is shared much more around the internet. So again, the people within our organizations are the ways that we can get messages out there to market about what a great place we are to work. So I guess some of the things we talked about, we share a lot, okay? So people who work within our organizations share stuff a lot, particularly on Facebook. People will share their colleagues' content or their own content in preference to stuff which is generated by the corporate being. That's not to say that corporate pages are not important, they are, but actually the importance comes from having a, a reliance also on individuals within your organizations to try and do that. Um, another piece of really interesting feedback was actually that getting senior people within organizations involved in this is incredibly important. So um, the sorts of shares that you get and the number of shares that you get actually increases exponentially if senior people within the organization are involved. So chief execs, C-suites, MDs, and so on. So again, it's not, this isn't just kind of getting people who have just joined an organization at the, in inverted commas, sort of bottom rungs of the ladder. This should go through our whole organization, top down, bottom up. Um, and actually, it's really important to start thinking about who are your organization's social influencers? Who are the people within your organizations that have big networks, that can become advocates, that can spread your word uh, more prevalently? Some, a lot of organizations have done this really well. They've started to set goals. They've started to look at, okay, well, if we pre share a piece of content, how many likes would we want? How many shares? How much traffic and how much engagement? Um, there are ways and means of getting your social initiative off the ground, and there are platforms that you can now engage in. There are employee advocacy programs that you can get involved in to start helping people within your organization do this particularly well. And hashtags are the way forward, okay? So it's not just the language that my children speak to me and hashtag something or other, and I don't know what they're talking about. This is about the ways that you can use it within the workplace to really encourage people to, to engage with your brand. I guess a couple of good examples coming up. So this is from Sky. I don't know whether there's anyone in the room from Sky at the moment. But Sky were looking at a way of revamping their employer brand, and they created a hashtag, work at, hashtag work at Sky. But actually, that then sort of was viewed internally as being a bit too corporate, work at Sky. So they started using the hashtag life at Sky, and this started to snowball. So this is an example of someone talking about the amazing colleagues that they've got. So talking about it's great to work with great people. And this was one that kind of started to proliferate itself around the, around the internet. Now, Sky also have the benefit of famous people. So Kay Burley, the newsreader, again, using the Life at Sky hashtag on here to try and engage people in that idea of working at Sky being amazing. And then taking it a stage further, you know, in the social consciousness a few months ago was England getting to the semi-finals and not quite getting to the final, which we all hoped that they would have done. But Sky, again, embracing that. So not only the It's Coming Home hashtag, but using the Life at Sky hashtag here as well. So Sky embraced the fact that hashtags and this social sharing can be a really great way of creating advocacy. So this isn't just, this is what our reception looks like. This is about, look at what an amazing place we are to work. And actually, we've got some internal examples. So this is an example um, of someone within the Reed Network, a lady named Claire. Now, in Claire, Claire is a professional within the employee, employee and, uh, brand and talent attraction sphere. But this is an example of something that Reed do. So once you've been working for Reed for 10 years, you get a gift of a thousand pounds and you get a six week paid sabbatical. So this is a letter from our chairman, James, to Claire, congratulating her on her tenure and telling her that she can go and enjoy herself for six weeks. So Claire's promoted that about, it's a great place to work, look at the sorts of benefits that we have. And actually that's not the only way that we do it. This is some guys who work at a Reed branch in Bournemouth talking about what a great place it is and the fact that they can head down to the beach after work. But again, the life at Reed hashtag being used here as a way of saying we're a great place to work. Similarly, James, again, welcoming our new people director onto the board a couple of months ago. So as well as some other programs we've got about women in leadership, um, again, life at Reed is a hashtag that's used here. Again, so this is as senior as you can get within our organization. I talked earlier about the importance of everything being top down as well as bottom up. This is James using LinkedIn and Twitter as well as a great way of getting people engaged in working for Reed.co.uk or the wider Reed group at this particular instance. Also, someone else, uh, this time using Instagram. It's a lady named Fuchsia, who's a, an EA within, um, uh, within the recruitment business. Um, again, using Life at Read as a way of saying, These are the great, this is a great place to work on Instagram, not Twitter or Facebook, this is Instagram. So another example is, hopefully this video will start running. Uh, this is Reebok, okay? So Reebok, big um, sportswear brand. Um, this is their kind of part of their employer branding effort behind us, again, a part of their advocacy. So... 
while also to saying, you know, look at our office, look at some of the work that you'll do. It will kick in in a second. You've also, it's a sportswear brand. People who work at Reebok might like to participate in sport, okay? So um, Reebok used, actually their CEO talks a lot throughout the course of this particular video, again, top down, talking about what it's like to work at Reebok and how important it is for people to have an amazing space they can work in where if you're interested in health and fitness, you can work out over lunch. And um, the hashtag here is probably not particularly corporate, right? Fit ass companies, not particularly corporate, but that's fine. It fits in with their employer brand. And actually this then was encouraged around the organization, people to use this hashtag. So again, the Reebok's corporate account promoted it, but also individuals working within Reebok started talking about the fact that this is what is this burpees, world burpee day. Okay, so people working within Reebok in a health and fitness environment, these are the sorts of great things that we get up to. Similarly, I mean, we don't have a gym at the office. I don't know whether any of you guys do, but if you have a gym, it probably doesn't look like this. But if you're interested in health and fitness and you, and you want to work at Reebok, okay, what a great place to work. So some really good examples of how that brand uh, is exploiting, A, the sorts of things they do as a company, but B, this hashtag to start generating advocacy. Another example there. Now, I've used the, got the word stalking up here. Now, it's not what you think it might be. Okay, so this is probably what we, what we would have thought of as stalking, but actually it's just kind of doing your homework. So we ask people about their behaviors when they're, say, so I found an organization like Reebok as an example. I want to go and work, at, work for them. What do I then do? So 42% of our surveyees, I'm going to keep using that. I don't know whether it's a word, but I'm going to go with it. Um, said that they'd search tagged posts about their new employer before starting. So I'm going to go and work for this organization. Let me find something about them before I go and work there. Um, and 42% as well has said that they'd searched for their employees um, or their new colleagues' profiles before going to work. So it becomes part of our kind of job search now that we look at the organization we're going to work for, we look at the sort of people that are there, and actually we start engaging with that brand and the people who are there before we've even stepped in the door. Now, really interesting here. So this is a really power, a powerful, positive thing, but a third of the people that we surveyed said that they have removed themselves from a process or turned down a job based on something they've seen before they've started to work somewhere. So this is a bit like about hygiene factors. This is not just doing hashtags, having corporate pages. This is talking about really positive stories, having great advocates within your organization to really engage people and actually understanding the power of negative stuff as well. So people said that reading positive experience, positive reviews online, positive posts shared and positive media attention are reasons that would help them decide to work for an organization. And unsurprisingly, the flip side is true when we said, you know, what would stop you applying? Negative online reviews, posts that you don't agree with, negative posts about a company and poor media attention, okay? So it's important to do things well, and it's also important not to do things badly, if that makes sense. Um, so I talked a little bit quickly earlier on about social influences. So social influences are a phenomenon, but 25% said they didn't trust social influences. Um, and half people said that they, they, they trusted advocacy from people that they know more than social influences. So social influences is great, but they're not as powerful as people who are currently working at your organization. So just quickly for this section, you know, people try before they buy. It's really important to give people a positive experience before they apply. Negative post means that people won't apply and people are cynical about influences, so authenticity is true. So quickly onto the last section, I'm gonna run out of time. Um, so how can you, you know, what does this mean in terms of advocacy? So how can you empower your people? So again, we asked the people involved in our survey, what would make people an advocate for their brand? And unsurprisingly, the things that came out, particularly around, around a younger audience, are feeling engaged with the brand and the values that you're trying to work for. So I'll quickly flick through these. But ultimately, the threads that come through here are understanding that I know what my purpose of my, this organization is. I know what they stand for. I know the good work that they do. I trust and believe in what, what we do as a business. These are things which people really, really value and really buy into. So if you've got those stories to tell, tell those stories. It's, quite, it's as simple as that. People being able to kind of create and involve in this kind of workplace culture. It's all about what it's like working there. It's all about kind of authenticity again. So if you've got great stories to tell and you're doing great things, make sure you talk about them. So would you be an advocate? Okay, so 36% said they would be interested in being like an official advocate for that brand. 34% they already are. But interestingly enough, 30% said that they wouldn't become an advocate. And largely that's because they're unhappy in their job um, and they lack shared beliefs with the organization at large. So, 
there's a huge tranche of people that are disengaged because they don't buy into what an organization is doing or they don't really want to be there. But the other 70% of the people that we really, as recruiters, have to try and engage, have to get them on side. We also asked them about being motivated or incentivized to be an advocate. So 53% 53 of people said, yes, I'll be an advocate, you know, and you can reward me for it as well, which is perhaps unsurprising. 47% um, said that they wouldn't be incentivized to do it. That's largely because they're happy to do it themselves. They want to post spont spontaneously. They think it's important to post around about without reward. Again, this authenticity point. And finally, you know, they want to protect their own personal authenticity, their own brand. And very quickly, EA is a really good example. So EA um, created a program called EA Insiders, which was cr um, bringing advocacy from around their global organization together. And of course, a, a proper program across the whole business, talking about not just news stories, but good news stories within the organization, people stories. And this EA Insiders is all about an internal advocacy program, which keeps talking to people who currently work there about what a great place it is to work. So continuing to um, create that advocacy. And this is an example of something they've done around International Women's Day. So what content do they want to see? Okay, this is quite self-explanatory, but it's incredibly important. The first is they want content that they see before they're going to work for an organization to be informative. It's not just kind of a, a sort of faceless kind of corporate mission statement. They want things which really tell them about what life is like at that organization. They also want content to be kind of authentic, okay? They d if they only see good news stories, Okay, some people think, well, there's only good news stories there. But actually, it is about authenticity. You know, people want to tr believe in things. But actually, you know, sometimes a, ba a, a bad news story is not necessarily a bad thing because it does add that layer of credibility to it. You know, we're not just wiping out all of the good news. We're not just wiping out all the bad news stories and promoting the good ones. But authenticity is key. Um, and finally, they also want to see stuff that is fun. They want to know what it's like working there. They want to know what their eight to five, nine to five, whatever it might be, is like. They want to know that it's a great place to work. So, in summary, what have we talked about? So, trust your people, empower them. There might be a mindset shift here, okay? There might be something really important, top down, that people within your organization have to embrace the, pa embrace the fact that the people in the organization are gonna be the ambassadors rather than the marketing department, okay? So that might be a challenge, but it's one that we need to embrace. Um, let your social presence grow organically, but also, you know, give it a nudge once in a while. Senior people in your organization being involved in this will allow you to kind of get more groundswell within the organization and create more external advocacy. Don't forget basic hygiene, okay? So, yes, positive stuff is great, but also look at the stuff which you are doing as an organization which might detract someone from working for you. And do what you can do to arrest those changes. And finally, set yourself goals. Be clear on what does good look like. If I want to create an advocacy program, where do I want to take it to? How many likes do I want? How many advocates do I want? They're the things which will make you successful.